we're here at the YouTube space in New York ahead of the 60th annual Grammy Awards. And I'm so pleased to be with Song of the Year nominee, oh, Erica Ender. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for being for here. Me. Oh, I'm it's, super happy it's to my, meet you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> and um, what, do you, what do you think when you hear someone say Song of the Year nominee? Amazing. The dreams do come true. You know, I came here 20 years ago from Panama. Um, I grew up in a very musical family and a very a, a multicultural family, let's say it like that, full of music. And my dream was to be a, an, an artist, an international artist and a songwriter as well, a composer. And um, I came in with my dreams, you know, and now uh, being able to do this crossover as a songwriter in Spanish is even more incredible that whatever I dreamt about. So it's it's a confirmation that dreams do come true and that you have to do your best throughout the whole path in order to, you know, have this rewardings from, from heaven, because I see it like that. Well, and, <laughs> and it, it certainly didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this is the result of lots of hard work. A 25 year 25 career. years. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me, because because I want to talk about the song. Yeah. And then we'll talk about, you know, your career and the other things that you're doing. Sure. But but um, tell me when you first met Luis Fonsi, how long have you known him? Uh, at least 10 years. Uh -huh. We've been friends for a long time. He has recorded songs that we have written together. Yes. And we have a great relationship. Uh, I love him. Uh, so much and his wife and the whole family mm. he's a he's a gentleman yeah. he's an amazing warrior and he's super talented mm. tell, so, tell me tell me what that means to you what does warrior mean to you he's a warrior because he knows what he wants and he fights for it mm. and he'd been a long long time as well so this is a big reward for him too for yeah. his whole career yeah. he has had I mean, a lot of achievements throughout his career. Mm -hmm. But this song opened the world to all of us. Yes. So he deserves and, it. And really, it's um, it, it's remarkable. Uh, and I want to ask you about this, that, that, you know, here we have a song in Spanish. Yeah. Um, huge smash on, yeah. on the radio. Yeah. Now nominated uh, for a Grammy Award. Is it your sense that... that um, Latin music is uh, is uh, there, there's more acceptance of Latin music in the I mainstream. I think so. I think so, and I'm so happy to see that. Um, I can um, we can't get all the credit because before us there are several things that happen. Gloria Estefan, for example, she's Latin and she did mm. an amazing job mm -hmm. with Latin rhythms and everything. Ricky Martin as well. Macarena made it throughout the world as well. But the difference between Gloria and Ricky and Shakira is that usually we Latin people, we were looking for the crossover, but always, you know, writing in, in English. That was the main goal, mm. to write in English something that would work. And in this case, the song is in Spanish and it broke every single record. It's been the longest number one tied up with Maria Carey's One Sweet Day on Billboard. Yeah, the Hot 100. Yes. Yeah, the Hot 100 yeah. and everything that happened in Spanish. I think that it, it has something special that did open a door. We're now in a different world. We have everything in the palm of our hands and we mm. can listen to whatever we want in any language we want. So I think it's amazing that finally the mainstream opened with Despacito, and now, for example, Luis Fonsi is singing another song in Spanish with Demi Lovato. Mm -hmm. So I think it's amazing, and I think that we're in a world that should have less boundaries, you know, and that should share more art and more love. And I, I I'm really happy to be part of this moment. Well, it certainly, I mean, it certainly speaks to making connections yeah. among people that I that, that I don't think existed mm -hmm. before. But I, I, I want to talk about the writing of the song mm -hmm. because I think I think Fonsi had. An the, idea. The, the initial yeah. idea. Tell, the tell me. genius idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, tell tell me about that conversation. Yeah, I went to his house. I was living in LA back mm -hmm. in the time. Mm -hmm. It was two years ago, September fifteenth, two thousand fifteen. We know the date. September wow. fifteenth, two thousand fifteen. I remember because we did a, a, a Facebook live at that moment. We were so happy while doing the song that I was like, "Oh my God, we have to post something!" And then we did this Facebook live saying we got a hit here, but it, we never thought that it, this would become the snowball. The endless snowball that it became. So uh, we started just, you know, looking for ideas and things. I brought him some uh, tracks that I had. And then he goes like, you know what? None of this is, you know, getting my attention as, as much as this idea that I had this morning. Mm. And he sings to me, despacito, that he brought that. And he tells me, vamos a hacerlo en una playa en Puerto Rico. And I answered, hasta que la jola grite, ay bendito. <laughs> 
know? You don't know what that means. No, I have no but idea. Puerto Ricans do. So um, the thing is that we started laughing out of that. And he had an idea of what he wanted for the chorus, but we changed some notes because it was too low. Uh, and a different phrasing, but at least, I mean, it was the perfect material for us to write mm. a hit mm. out of that. And I thought it was genius, the Despacito, I thought it was genius. So then, out of that, we started doing everything from scratch, looking for the whole concept, trying to do something that would take him out of his comfort zone. I mean, people... How, how, do, how do you do, from how the do, you audience, do that? From the audience yeah, angle. Yeah, yeah. Because he used to be a pop singer, a ballad singer, mm. and this would take him out of that looking for some urban fusions, which is what's going on right now. Sure. So, but keeping his essence, you know, and he's such a versatile um, artist. So I think that it was perfect for him. He dances, he sings, whatever you can give him, uh, whatever he wants to, to express. And um, I think it was an amazing job we did together with a guitar at his home studio in a very organic way. Hmm. Um, not thinking of what, what was the outcome, just thinking of putting the, the best we could in something where we were having fun and being as responsible as possible as well. Because this uh, kind of genre could be very aggressive with women. Mm. And he's a very smart guy. He usually writes with women so he can have that angle. To, so to soften it a little bit. Well, I, yeah. I, 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 I want to talk about that because, um, y y you know, the, the, the song is an interesting mix mm -hmm. of... Fancy's, you know, sort of pop influence. Yeah. And then later we, we bring Daddy Yankee yes. and reggaeton into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, um, and those are both, and please don't take this the wrong way, they're, you know, they're, these are, you know, male oriented perspectives. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, how did you bring you know, or make sure that the female perspective was being careful addressed? with the lyrics? Uh huh. There's poetry there, there's elegance, mm -hmm. there's there's a very classy way of saying things that could connect right away with people, but at the same time, it has art. Mm. It, it is a song that has art and that could fit any genre. Mm. I sing it in a very acoustic way, as you saw me, and it's from the heart and you can, you know, fall in love with it or you can dance with it or whatever you want to do with it because it, it has that whole thing that makes a song special to go throughout the world, and mm. we didn't know that mm. the moment we were doing it, yeah. we had no idea yeah. what happened there. But you knew, we're just but, grateful. <laughs> yeah, but you guys, you, you had a sense you had written a hit. Yeah, because you feel it. You feel it on your skin when you're doing. But normally, when you get together, you feel like you're doing a hit, mm. <laughs> unless you know the muse is not as, it's not flowing as you yeah. were expecting. Normally, I mean, when you have this much time on this career, you know when you have a hit in your hands, but you never know how how. Hi, it's gonna yeah. fly. I, I, I mean, we did get a, a completely different perspective on the song mm -hmm. in your performance here yeah. today. Um, a, a, a beautiful ballad. Yeah. Uh, and and um, it, it gives a you know kind of a, a different lens yeah. on the emotion exactly. of of the song. It, when you go out in your own performances, is mm -hmm. that how you'll perform yes. the song? Normally, I do it like that. Yeah. 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 Does it does more it, like a, a singer songwriter? You know, right. perspective. Right. Does does it connect more for you singing <gasps> it that way rather than? It's the way I felt it. Yeah. You know, and I I, I didn't want to do the same thing, and I was releasing a CD as well, mm -hmm. a singer songwriter CD that mm -hmm. that was recently uh, nominated for the Latin Grammys in this past year, 2017, and uh, I decided to record the song because my fans were asking me to. Normally, when I write for another artist, I just let them, you know, have their space. And whenever time goes by, I sing the songs that I wrote for them or with them in my concerts or in, in a CD, but like two, three years after, you know? And this time was different because everyone decided to record this pasito. Yeah. And then my friends were like, are you gonna record it or not? And, and since I, uh, I sang it and, and I um, uploaded a, a Facebook Live as well, singing it live, people were like, it became viral. And they, they became like, okay, are you gonna do it or not? So I decided to put it as a bonus track. But it's the way I felt it. It had to do with the CD and with a very acoustic way of, of saying things because I really wanted people to focus on the message, mm. not on whatever was going you know, around there's too much noise nowadays. Yeah, yeah. In the world, you know, you know there's um, so so you've done all manner of co-writing with mm -hmm. with all all kinds of artists, not just uh, Louise Fonsi. And there's um, there's an art 
clearly, as you've described it, there, there's an art to working with another artist mm -hmm. to achieve an artistic goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, what is it, what, what do you think it is about you uh -huh. that makes you a good collaborator? I think that uh, art is made for sharing, not for competing. Whenever you sit down, looking for the best thing for the song, it's like having a marriage. Whenever you get married, you're looking for the best thing for your family, for your baby, you know? To me, a song is a baby, and I have to take care of it. And whomever I'm working with has to have that same frequency, you know? Same. So we're doing the best thing we can in order for that baby to shine. So I don't, I don't write with ego involved. Yeah. I write with my heart, and I have no filters between my heart and my hands whenever mm. I'm writing a song. That's great. That's great. Um, uh, so the song, uh, you know, Despacito, you know, recorded, um, you know, kind of had a, a little life of its own, and then along comes... Daddy Just, Yankee. Uh, well, Daddy yeah. Yankee yeah. Well, first. He, uh, yeah, first. Bon C has that, all yeah. that credit. Right. After we finish the song with the guitar and everything, I mean, he's, as, a, as, as I was telling you, he's a warrior and he's a, a guy that is very smart, very clever. He knows what he likes mm. and he knows what he wants. And he was the one who decided to work with the producers the way he wanted the song. And then he decided to call Daddy Yankee, which... I mean, his collaboration was genius as mm. well. He did the rap and the pasito, pasitos, mm -hmm. which is genius as well. And then um, like three or four months went by and suddenly one day he calls me, Erica, Justin Bieber wants to record a, a remix of the song out of nowhere. And we already had the Portuguese version ready mm. and the English version written. We were looking for collaborations in the Anglo market. Universal was looking for the collaborations. I think they had like two artists in mind. And suddenly Justin Bieber pops in. So he tells me, what do you think? I'm like, are you crazy? Go ahead. I mean, if you're happy with it, I'm more than happy with it. And when he tells me he's going to record it mainly in Spanish, I was like, oh, mm. my God. That's such a blessing because it's going to be a crossover where Latin music gets to be in the in the place it deserves. That, you know? that was a that, that, and we felt so that was honored. a big big moment yeah, to, to make sure. sure that that he sung it in Spanish. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm wondering, did he ask did he ask for your advice on on the Spanish, Who? Justin? No, no, no. I haven't met him. Can you believe? You haven't met him? No, no, uh, not yet. We need to arrange this <laughs> somehow. Yeah, right away. Right. <laughs> right. No, we're we're working together at the same sun. We we haven't uh, met uh -huh. yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so when you when you finally heard the track with with Justin on it, yeah, I loved it. First thought. First I thought, thought I thought that uh, whatever they added was amazing because it was kind of like a an intro for people to understand what was going on with the rhythm and everything, and mm. they took him to the to the Latin part. Mm. Uh, I think his pronunciation was pretty good. He did an amazing job. Yeah. He didn't have that R sound that normally the the strong that, sound that, that normally kind of the Americans R. have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He did an amazing job. Yeah. An amazing yeah. job. Well, and I think it, it, it was, everything flowed, yeah. you know? The, I mean, the results are, are remarkable. So, uh, it, it, worldwide radio smash, which which makes me think, and and, and I'm interested in, in when when was the first time you heard a song of yours on the radio? Oh, my God. Well, in Panama, when I was really young. I was like 16 years old when I recorded my first CD. Mm. So in Panama, but I mean, in a bigger picture, uh, the first thing was a, an English version that I wrote uh, for a smash hit called Apuro Dolor, written by Omar Alfano, which is Panamanian as well. Mm -hmm. Some four recorded that and they sang it at the Grammys as well and everything. So that was the first time, right when I came to the US, like uh, almost two years after I got here. And then Candela, which was of my own inspiration, collaborating with another uh, composer. Uh, that was the song that led me buy a house, uh, car, everything, and live out of music, you know, start living out of music. Because as I told you, I came from Panama, where mm. the platform is pretty different. Yeah, it, so was, it was hard to there kind were no of find, opportunities find your footing. To internationalize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you've, and, and you've talked about the challenges of, you know, being, being a young songwriter, young female, female. songwriter. Yeah. Um, still, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, still, still. We'll talk. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk about that and, and yeah. being and being taken seriously. Yeah. Well, taken seriously, I think that that's a matter of your attitude. Mm. And I, I always um, try to be as, try no, I, I am as, as responsible as possible, as professional as possible. I try to, you know, be as, I mean, a happy person at the same time, a very social person, but whenever it, it's got to do with work, I deliver. Mm. I always deliver. 
But when I came to the U.S. at the beginning when I was knocking doors, I was 22 years old. So pretty young, a girl. Uh, there were no women in this industry in the Latin music. I mean, there have been several, but in certain moments of time. It's not like, oh, where are the, song the female songwriters? Right. You I'll go hang with them. No, yeah. no yeah. you wouldn't find that. Uh, right after that came Claudia Brandt, who has made an amazing career as well. Mm. But we were like two, three, I mean, that were, you know, like knocking doors around. So whenever uh, I started sending songs for male singers to the A&R departments of the label, record labels, uh, they would call me to say, you know, it's beautiful, but it's too feminine. I was singing the demos mm. and I was sending Erica Ender and the demos. So, you know, I, whenever you really know what's, that what your mission is about. I mean, I knew that I was made for this and I would look different ways of getting there. Hmm. So I just decided to go to a different record label, ask for a male singer to sing the songs, <laughs> and I send it like E. Ender. Ah, okay. Suddenly the, the, the song started to, you know, get a placement. So hmm. then I understood, I didn't take it in a bad way because I do believe that anyway, I mean, it's a, it's a men market. Uh, but at the same time, I owe a lot to a lot of men, mm. you know? So I didn't see it as a feminist. I saw it like lack of vision. The, the industry wasn't ready for women to take those mm. places. And I said, you know what? I'm going to deliver. I'm going to deliver. And my talent and my work is the one that is going to open the doors. And as you see, that's what happened. Yeah. For sure. For all the um, years. Yeah. Um, uh, so your you have a whole solo career, as you, as, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, released a, a, a record, and the name of the record in the May, last one. The last yeah, one. Yeah, tatuajes, which Ta means yeah, tattoos. You. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, but we were we were mentioning just be before we started, you were talking about these. These are you know kind of the tattoo the the the, the internal soul tattoos. The internal <laughs> tattoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one that one acquires. Yes. O o throughout over, life. Over, yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. um, as you look back now and you're and you're writing songs based on, you know, kind of experience and wisdom, you know, to to a certain degree, have you have you changed as a songwriter? Well, I think we all change as human as humans and as professionals, but the essence remains the same. Mm. I'm, I'm the same child, uh, the, the same little kiddo that is always, you know, connected with the universe and seeing wonders and everything. Uh, you know, the, the kids used to have a lot of imagination and we, the adults, are the, are the one that are cutting them mm. off. So I decided that I wanted to always be that little girl. Hmm. I mean, using every skill that life gives me, understanding from the experiences and of course getting, you know, um, bigger in, in certain ways, uh, I mean, but at the same time, I just wanted to keep that girl. So I forgot what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Changing as a songwriter. I, yeah, well, I've changed for sure. But the essence is the same. Yeah. The essence is that inner yeah. child. Yeah. The essence is trying to understand and connect with other people's hearts. Mm. Trying to always find the way of writing my own soundtrack, but other people's soundtrack mm. and understanding the responsibility I have in my hands because you don't get a talent to get millionaire and, or, yeah. or, you know, to look yeah. for fame. There's something, there's a purpose, a major purpose, and you have to find it throughout your life. One day through experiences, through whatever happens, you get to understand that you're here not for yourself, but for others at the mm. same time. Mm. And that music is for everyone. Yeah. You know, I, I had a, I had, what you're saying is, resonates in that I had a fascinating conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago with a guy named Jimmy Iovine. Jimmy Iovine um, produced and engineered records with John Lennon and Patti Smith um, and Bruce Springsteen and went on to found Interscope Records. I mean, this guy is one of the most successful people in music. And we were talking about his career. Mm -hmm. And he said the one thing he kept in mind, and this blew me away, the one thing he's kept in mind the entire time is he wants to be of service of service to yes. the people that he was working with in the studio, yeah. of service to the artists on his label, to his business partners. Um, I found that just fascinating. You need that. The more, I always say to my people, the more I travel, the more I meet people, the more I get to write. Hmm. Because you get to see more stories, more, more ways of thinking. Whenever you go from here to, I don't know, Asia or Europe, you get to understand that the essence is 
just the same. We're all the same. It just changes the, the angle, the way of seeing things. You have the same tongue speaking another language, the same body dancing another rhythm, you know, mm. the same food prepared in a different way. And at the end, we're all the same, mm. you know? Yeah. So it's amazing to understand how people being the same can think in a different way. And whenever you get to understand that and decodify, you know, the, the way of uh, expressing whatever your art, you get to connect with people. But whenever you get to understand that, and besides that, beyond that, you understand that the essence is the same, then you get to connect with mm. the world. Mm. So, so tell me, um, speaking of the little girl, who were your musical heroes growing oh up? Oh my God. Who did, who did you hear? So many people, like you have no idea. <laughs> we could, you, you could, we could uh, say names the whole day here because my dad was half American, half Panamanian. So mm. he used to listen to Ned King Cole, Richard Chamberlain. Frank Sinatra was his favorite, for example. And then I used to listen to everything that had to do with Mexico, Puerto Rico, merengue, salsa, jazz, smooth jazz. From my mom's side, she's Brazilian. So imagine, bossa nova, samba, everything. So mm. there was a big mix that I r I'm really grateful for because it all stood right here in the back of my mind. And that's why nowadays the professional, you know, gets that benefit because mm. I get to go from Spanish to Portuguese to English or from one genre to another without a problem. And it has to do with my upbringing. Yeah. So I had a lot of people that I liked, like, for example, on the, on the Brazilian side, I used to listen to Caetano Veloso, to Gilberto Gil, you know, to mm -hmm. Antonio Carlos Jobim, and then Frank Sinatra on my dad's side, and from Los Panchos to whatever, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, I think they were amazing. They mm -hmm. were one of my favorite artists ever. I admired so much yeah. Gloria Estefan for what she did, mm -hmm. you know, and, turning and all down of the that, walls. And yeah. all of that finds its all way. All of that defines me. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm not from one side. I'm like, I'm yeah. open to, yeah. I'm open to all whatever. the way, all the way up to song of the year nominee mm -hmm. at the 60th Grammy Awards. Erica, thank you so much thank you. for coming and talking with us. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You bet. <laughs>